Hello and good evening from all of us here in the UK and Europe. Sadly, we've just heard the news that Michael Collins, the Apollo 11 pilot, has just died. Our thoughts are with his family and friends at this sad time. Now, for those who don't know me, I'm Alistair Scott, a past president of the Society. But now, as chair of the Events Committee, I try to keep all our events and activities going and I'm always on the lookout for interesting and forward-looking talks. It's great to have so many of you here tonight. I think we're well over 100, and I think the furthest from us is probably in Hawaii. So welcome. And uh, what I'd like to do then is, uh, is tell you a little bit about what we've been up to, because we have a, uh, a fascinating talk tonight. Uh, this is the British Interplanetary Society's 17th live streamed evening lecture since the start of the first lockdown in March of last year. I hope some of you were able to attend our Beyond the Moon Symposium on 12th of April, in which we celebrated the 60th anniversary of Yuri Gagarin's historic space flight with three of our colleagues from Russia. The conference platform we used enabled us to bring two more speakers from Russia and our keynote speaker from ESA, from Nordreich, and we were able to meet up in the bar afterwards. Unfortunately, the drinks were virtual too. Tickets are now on sale for our Reinventing Space Conference in the QE2 Conference Centre, live, I should say, on the 28th to 30th of June. We expect it to be a live face-to-face -face with social distancing if required. Today we are using Crowdcast for both the presentation and the Q&A. If you enjoy this evening and want to make a small donation, please click on the Donate button at the bottom right-hand side of this page. Every little helps to cover our costs. Please use the question system to answer ask your questions anytime during the talk. And as most of you know, you can also vote for your favorite questions to go to the top of the list by clicking on the vote button. I'm pleased to say that we have tonight with us Tiago Lurero from ESA Mission Control Center. And he is going to tell us the significance of Mars on the 10th of June 2023. I'll now hand over to Fabrizio to do the introductions and to get the show on the road. Over to you Fabrizio. Thank you Alistair and uh, good evening to everybody attending this talk and thanks uh, immediately to Tiago for uh, his availability, his exceptional availability and uh, for this talk. And uh, this evening we are, go we are going actually to listen to very interesting things. We are used uh, since many years about uh, uh, hearing about the EDL of NASA missions on Mars, EDL stands for Entry, Descent and Landing. But uh, ESA does these things too. ESA is at his third attempt to land on Mars, basically. And um, But this time it's going to, to land with a, an exceptional rope that uh, will uh, do so much for science and exploration that is uh, really unthinkable now to qualify what, what, what the result will be of this mission. But before he, the rover can do anything, it must be land safely on Mars. And this is the topic of the talk of Tiago, which uh, I will quickly introduce. And uh, I met him recently, thanks to our common friends uh, in ESOC. And uh, he's an aerospace engineer from the Technical University of Lisbon in Portugal, and he's working with the European Space Operations Center, ESOC, since 2004. He is responsible for the ground segment development and for the mission operation preparation for the future Mars exploration missions. And in, this, is, this is the reason why he's going to be the flight director of the, the cruise and landing on Mars of ExoMars rover. Before his current role, he was also part of the operations teams of other uh, ESA Earth observation and astronomy missions, including Gaia. And, uh, and um, and uh, again, I'm I'm very excited about this uh, about this uh, this event because we really I think it's probably one of the first events uh, or w one of the first talks for the for the wide public, in which all the details about the landing on Mars uh, with the NISA mission will be exposed and uh, and uh, maybe with some other stories <laughs> around them. So I leave it to Tiago to start his talk, and uh, I remind again everybody to. You can start asking questions during the talk, and you can vote them using the button down the screen. Well, Tiago, thanks again. You're welcome. I, I thank you for the invitation and for the interest. So, so thanks a lot for having me. 
it's a real pleasure and an honor in such a uh, an audience uh, to to talk about my work and and what uh, we are doing here so i'm very excited i hope you enjoyed the talk uh, it is a bit awkward to do this uh, in front of a screen uh, now i'm looking at my video so it uh, feels a bit strange but uh, i would love to be on stage but okay so um, we have what we have and uh, i'll uh, hope to make it uh, for an interesting talk so um i chose to to name the talk uh mars 10th of june 2023 because this is the our uh landing date uh so we already have it uh, planned and so when we when we arrive uh at mars on on that day we'll we'll see something similar to this okay we won't see but this is what's going to happen this is an animation produced at the time of VDL uh, of Schiaparelli, uh, but uh, it's, it illustrates what happens. So the capsule arrives at the top of the Mars atmosphere at around five kilometers per second of speed. Uh, top of atmosphere is about 120 kilometers. They will start breaking on the atmosphere. Temperatures will reach about 1500 degrees Celsius. Um, we will open our parachutes at about 11 kilometers. Um, there are two parachutes, so I remind you, this, this is for the Schiaparelli uh, animation. I didn't have one for, for ExoMars 2022, but we'll release the, the front shield at about seven kilometers and uh, we'll do the final deceleration with, uh, with rockets uh, in the final few meters. So during the entry uh, in the atmosphere, the, we'll have a radio signal block uh, due to the plasma around the spacecraft, so we will not have the, the the luxury of having a telemetry link. And from that point onwards, this is where we start this, this famous six minutes of terror, whereby uh, it takes about seven, six minutes to get from the top of the atmosphere to the ground, and uh, we'll have no information. And then if you account for the uh, one-way light time, things will have already happened on Mars, and uh, we will have no information directly on Earth, only after post-processing the, the data that is retransmitted. When we land, uh, we will do uh, operations called rover egress. And uh, we've seen the, the video of the, of the rover driving out. So egress means, okay, rover driving out, we'll have to do joint operations with the, with the rover control center. I'll speak about that later on. And this whole sequence from the top of the atmosphere until we land is called uh, EDL, Entry, Descent and Landing. So this is the reason, and this kind of combination of this is the, the reason from all the work that we are doing so far. And this is then working backwards what I would like to, to talk about to you today. How do we get there? So ExoMars is the, is the second uh, mission of the, of the ExoMars. Uh, so, Sorry, ExoMars 2022 is the second mission of the ExoMars uh, program. Uh, it, this is here a schematic of the of the timeline, including the two missions. So it consists of the mission that was launched in 2016, the, the Trace Gas Orbiter. It arrived at Mars in, in October 2016, uh, and uh, it, it carried uh, a test lander. So ExoMars is, uh, has its origins in the in the former Aurora program of the of the space agency that was dedicated to the to the exploration of the solar system in search of life. The program itself is not active, but there are missions uh, like ExoMars which continue the the, the 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 original idea. So ExoMars has had a, a troubled history um, throughout uh, several configurations from, from a single rover to a rover flying jointly with, with NASA to a rover flying with the TGO to, and finally, uh, through a cooperation of Roscosmos uh, has enabled two, two missions. So first the orbiter that is now at, at, at Mars, a very successful mission. Uh, in, in, in fact, you might have heard the, the support that it does for the current landers on Mars. And very visibly now with the landing of, of the Perseverance rover, uh, retransmitting a lot of data uh, and the videos from from the from from their uh, landing and, and through Mars. So the objectives of of the ExoMars missions are basically to search for signs of life on, in in Mars. So the name comes from 
like exobiology and, and on, on on Mars, uh, but also to study the interior of Mars, the water distribution and its and its chemistry, and also we the rover will will have a drill that will drill up to two meters depth in the on the surface of, of Mars, which is a kind of a, a first. And we'll do incremental steps in, in preparation of the of the sample return mission. So how to to learn all about uh, roving on Mars and to and to do all these uh, uh, things which are not so trivial as, as we will see throughout the, the talk. Um, so the 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 mission, the second mission, is a is a rover, which is now we all know named Rosalind Franklin. Which is built by Airbus UK. Uh, there's a static uh, science platform uh, built by NPO Lavochkin, so from from Russia. And there are uh, several European elements in in, in in there. So I'll talk about a bit more uh, later. And uh, and uh, uh, they will be carried to Mars on the inside the descent module, also built by NPO Lavochkin. And, and all of this is brought to Mars on a carrier module uh, built by OHB. And the whole project is managed uh, at industrial level by Telesalenia Space in Italy, which is our prime prime contractor. Uh, so one, one thing, and uh, it's just about the only thing I'm going to say about these programmatics in, in this is that uh, ExoMars is not uh, in the science program, so it's a it's an optional program. This is an exploration program, which is optional, and uh, it means that the member states contribute optionally uh, to the funding of the program, which imposes uh, some constraints on uh, on the setup of in industrial consortium and etc. So it's not a typical is a mission uh, in this in this sense. And today I'm going to talk about the second uh, mission, so it's on Mars 2022, which there will be a bit of TGO as well. So before I, I go into the the depth of the of the and the details of the mission, so ExoMars is only possible uh, in, in in cooperation with with Roscosmos and uh, NASA, more uh, precisely JPL, for the relay network and, and some instruments. And of of course we, we welcome cooperation. Without cooperation, we can't we can't really do the job, uh, or this job at least uh, in this particular case. But it brings it brings its own challenges. So uh, we have uh, a very integrated spacecraft, uh, and so we, we have to overcome uh, a lot of uh, cultural and technical differences. And uh, okay, it, that makes the task quite interesting, uh, I have to say. Uh, and so even if ESA has a long experience in, in cooperation in several areas, uh, it tends, I think, I might be wrong, but I think it's one of the first times that we have such an integrated system uh, as opposed to to have very clean technical and, and formal interfaces, as for example on on, on the ISS, uh, I would not think, in terms of, at least in terms of the hardware. So, so the the first uh, uh, meetings were, I, I remember when I joined, uh, it was a, it was a real challenge um, through through the go through the translation. I mean, just. Try as an example, try to translate data relay into Russian and you'll have a, a funny surprise. Um, at least depending on how does the, who does the translation. So, so how, does, how does this work? So, so we have, first of all, we have the directors of the agencies doing high level agreements and, and, and corporations. It's so, it's all very nice. And, uh, and so, you know, so we, we go and, and then we do this and then we get we get the managers to to do the work, and okay, at this point you will have a bunch of uh, powerpoints, um, and then the engineers go to work, and and then okay, it's all about uh, understanding each other and etc. and and you know talking, and sometimes we don't uh, manage to 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 make ourselves understood, and it takes a long time, and then uh, when we do, then normally the effect is that we don't really agree uh, <laughs> with each other. So uh, it takes a lot of um, a patience, uh, I would say, and a lot of uh, uh, understanding, a lot of exploration, a lot of dialogue uh, to, to be, to finally agree and, and, and come to some sort of, of uh, 
agreement on, on the way forward. So this is something that is pervasive through, throughout the entire the entire project. And uh, okay, so before before I go um, further, then I'd like to 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 show the the complexity or the bit of hint at the complexity of the spacecraft. This is an illustration of how the the um, the composite, the spacecraft composite, as it's called, uh, is uh, is assembled. The different elements. So we have. I'm going to try it with a with the with a pointer with a laser pointer. So hope it works. So that's the carrier module, the descent carrier module with its uh, solar panels and fuel tanks and communication equipment. The on top of it we have the descent module, and this is how it's assembled inside. So the carrier module, and we have the descent module. And inside the descent module, we've got the hover on top of the platform. And uh, this is the platform alone, so it's a kind of a intricated stack of of, uh, of elements that have to, to work together. So here's a bit of a blown up view, a bit more details on, on how it looks like. This is, uh, there's a separation mechanism when you arrive to Mars so that we eject the descent module. The carrier module will burn in the Mars atmosphere. And then the different elements. So we've got the front shield that is separated. We've got the rear jacket that's separated later. That sees the parachute system uh, uh, bags where the parachutes will will be contained. This is how the uh, platform looks on on landing. So they'll be folded the uh, the, the elements to in order to fit inside the 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 module, which after landing will will open and deploy as a, as we call to allow for the rover to, to stand up and and uh, drive out so now we have uh, this was the the slides before was the ones i used to use before we had the real hardware built and, and been tested now we we can show uh, how the real hardware looks like you can see it's a relatively big spacecraft uh, so this is the in the in the test chamber uh, some time ago this is the the, uh, the, the the rear jacket being put on top of the platform with the solar panels folded. Here you have some view into the into the uh, carrier module. You can see the, the round things are the are the, are the tanks, the, the solar array supports, um, and that on the on the right side is the is the is the platform. I have a couple more pictures with the with the rover on top. So this is the, the rover um, in, in its configuration for the for the for the cruise, and this is um, also yeah the wider view of it. So just like to show you a bit the um, the parachute um, configuration. So uh, we'll have uh, so whereas Caparelli had uh, had one parachute, this, this system has. Uh, as two or rather four, because the, the, there is a pilot parachute to drag the, the the main parachute out. So there's a main parachute one and a main parachute two. Uh, and uh, so for the for the parachutes, I also have a couple of pictures which I thought could be interesting. This is a, a photo of the test rig at JPL uh, where uh, we do the extraction tests of the of the of the parachute. So there's a is basically to, to test how the parachute is extracted out of the bag and this was used to troubleshoot the the, the parachute issues which which have been uh, found in the in the in the testing uh, previously so we're not completely out of the woods there but the, the tests are ongoing in fact there's ongoing tests now in the us uh, in in this in this period and this is a picture of the of the test vehicle where we I tested uh, one of the main parachutes uh, last last year, I think. Um, I just have now a small info infographic, uh, just the relative sizes of of the of the rover and the and the, and the overall spacecraft. You've seen in the previous pictures with proportion to the people, so it's quite a big spacecraft. The total landing mass is about two thousand kilos. Which is a, a relatively heavy or a very heavy payload to land on Mars, and we will be using the main second main parachute, is a 35 meter, which is at the limit of of what single parachutes uh, uh, are are done. So on Earth, you tip for bigger applications, you tend to use multiple parachutes, and this is, I think, the biggest parachute for a Mars application. So 
So this is all uh, kind of very complex, and and so we wanted to Isa wanted to 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 learn how to land on Mars. So therefore, in the in the TGO uh, mission, uh, we embarked a, a so-called EDL demonstration module, uh, EDM, which is more generally known as uh, Schiaparelli, uh, and it was a success, as we can see from, from this picture. Uh, it's not being really ironic, uh, it, it, the landing was a bit rough, okay? But uh, the EDL or the landing itself is, is, the, is the hardest part of landing on Mars. So in a previous talk, I think Michel Denis told you all about the general challenges of the planetary missions. And landing on another body is, is, is kind of the, one of the ultimate challenges there. Um, okay, all, all bodies are, have their own characteristics. Mars is especially difficult because it's got an atmosphere which is dense enough to, to, to cause trouble. We, we need, to, we need to, to, to take it into account, but it's not, there's not enough of it to just break using aerodynamic methods, be it by the, the uh, heat uh, dissipation from shield or by uh, parachute. Um, that, that's not enough. So you need to have several systems uh, to, to, to land on Mars. By the way, this is also one of the reasons uh, that typically Mars missions tend to, to land on the northern hemisphere of Mars, because that's where the lowlands of Mars are, so you have more atmosphere to allow you to, to break. So it's not, it's like the Earth, where there's a dense atmosphere, you can use mostly uh, uh, aerodynamic methods. It's not like the Moon, where there is no atmosphere, so you, you can just use one system of uh, chemical propulsion or rockets to, to, to break. Uh, we need to use a combination of things, and this is one of the reasons that makes this um, very, very complex, plus the fact that it has to be all completely automated. And so, um, oops, sorry, I didn't change the slide. <laughs> this is a bit of, um, so Mars is hard, and, and uh, um, so uh, that with Caparelli was, was the, the last time that ESA tried. Um, to be fair, Beagle 2 seems to have landed okay, as shown by pictures then uh, from orbit later on. It just seems to have been unlucky with the, with the deployments. So maybe Beagle was a half success, but uh, we didn't have any telemetry to, to, to confirm it. So it's one of the, the things that is important uh, when you try to debug in your landings on Mars is to, to have telemetry on the, for the descent phase. And so this picture is uh, intended to show with the statistics of, of uh, landing uh, on, on, on Mars. And so kind of Mars wins, it's about 50% of a success rate. Um, NASA has tried more times than ESA, and in fact, they've sent spacecraft to Mars at almost all the uh, opportunities uh, to, to launch there. And, uh, and in many cases, uh, they're doing spacecraft, uh, which are evolutions of, of previous designs or, or done in pairs. So consider the, the MERS, the Spirit Opportunity, were a pair, Curiosity, Perseverance, but not exactly a pair, but a very much uh, common design. And, uh, and they sent uh, low-cost missions first, um, and, and uh, orbiters first, like the Mars Global Surveyor. So there was a, a whole series of, of a Mars program there. Um, and uh, one of the things that they also um, seem to be is, is a, a, a bit more flexible with uh, approaches like make versus buy that we don't do in ESA. Um, so we are a bit more constrained in terms of the of uh, how you set up these things. And of course, there's always the, the question of budgets. So compare the 2020 Perseverance, which is already similar to Curiosity and they're about billion US dollars, if I trust the numbers that, that I thought, and where the whole ExoMars is probably just under 1.5 billion, and this is two missions and two landers, so much more complex. So I think it illustrates a bit the different approaches. I, I don't say which one is right, which one is wrong, but uh, I just thought that uh, when comparing ESA to, to, to NASA, we should be fair a bit and say, you know, also the approaches are quite different. 
on, on how we do things. So I wanted to to spend a bit of time well, on the uh, looking at the um, what's involved in in, in landing uh, from the from the spacecraft point of view. So this is a, a schematic uh, of the of the avionics of uh, of the spacecraft composite. So the courtesy of Talas Alenia, they kindly let me use this uh, slide. And uh, and uh, so the, the main elements of the of the landing system are actually evolved from the Schiaparelli experience. And then with the lessons learned, we did get the telemetry from Schiaparelli. So this is what uh, uh, allowed us to understand uh, what um, what uh, uh, went wrong and, and how to improve it. So the main uh, things first, so we, we, we've got a UHF transceiver, which is uh, which will send real-time telemetry uh, during during the landing, so this real-time telemetry will not be received on Earth. At least we will not. We might be able to see a, a carrier signal, but it will not have enough power to to decode a telemetry from it. But this data will be first recorded on board and will be transmitted to to relay orbiters that will be observing the 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 landing. So they'll be able to record the signal and send send it on later to to Earth, so we, we can process it. <coughs> Then the the carrier module, which is illustrated with, by the red box here on the on the on the left side, and uh, the the separation systems. So this this part will be uh, ejected. It will be uh, it will burn in the atmosphere of of Mars. There's uh, also a whole analysis on on uh, whether there is any chance of uh, of recontacting uh, after separation, etc. Uh, then uh, these systems here. Um, our separation system, so they they make sure that we can cleanly cut the harness and there's no electric noise being put into into the system from from the act of separating uh, live cables and, and things like that. Uh, then uh, we'll have the the IMU, uh, which is inertial measurement unit, which will provide inertial guidance, uh, essentially attitude and acceleration as we descend. Uh, which will be used to to sense the the, the atmosphere and and uh, the deceleration and also to to judge the, the attitudes uh, of the of the spacecraft to, to to start with. And then we'll also have a radar, uh, which is a multi beam radar, which will help us judge the the height uh, over the surface and also by some improvement of the of the signal processing with respect to Schiaparelli to have a secondary. Uh, attitude uh, indication, uh, not as, uh, as precise, if you like, from the IMUs, but uh, will be based on direct measurements. Uh, then the the front shield, which essentially the field shields to, uh, to 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 get through the the atmosphere, and uh, the parachute system, uh, which is the containing all the pilot parachutes and the main parachutes when when we get to Mars. And uh, then we'll have the the rear jacket, which is so the the back covering of the of the of the descent module. With it houses the 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 parachute and the the so-called rear jacket antenna, uh, from which the UHF transmitters uh, uh, send the data during the during the descent. And then we'll have finally uh, braking engines uh, controlled by by this unit, the CACU. Uh, which uh, which will provide the the final deceleration. So the, the the systems involved are a combination of European and, and Russian units. So the um, the computer is European, the IMUs is European, and the, the radar is also European contribution. And so are the are the parachutes. Uh, UHF uh, is um, is European as well. But the TCSU and the braking engines are. Are, are, are Russian. This uh, unit, control unit, which is responsible for many of the pyros activations, etc., is also Russian. And the so the carrier module is European, as as we've seen. So there's a quite a big complexity in integrating all all this. So um, for Schiaparelli, the the the, the failure was uh, um, a chain of events, which is uh, a bit, I would say. Typical in in such a complex system, you, you have a chain of things happening, and uh, but most notably we, we had, let's say, uh, insufficiently studied 
aerodynamic um, dynamics behavior around the the parachute opening so the models weren't weren't very good uh, later on this was improved and now we've been able to reproduce the dynamics but uh, before it didn't so this led to very high rates being measured by the IMU and uh, the IMU telemetry actually could indicate that but this was not understood by the by the software and then uh, this resulted in integrating so you the IMU was since it has to integrate the, the, the rates in order to derive an attitude so you deliver the wrong the wrong attitude which then coupled with the slant range from the from the radar and uh, by simple trigonometrics there was a, a wrong altitude uh, that was computed and then the system believed uh, it was on the ground so it started advancing through the steps of the landing sequence very quickly so we didn't get it got to the end but unfortunately we're still very very high up and so this is why it then crashed but this was why i i refuse to call it a, a failure is uh, it was a test and um, and so we the test kind of filled its purpose we we learned uh, what was uh, what was there and what was the the, the reason and all of that has been kind of put back in in the in the design of the of the exomars 2022 so uh, we we hope at least will those mistakes will not be made and uh, and so we hope to test things enough uh, uh, more th th this time to to catch everything that would get us so there was a uh, yeah so the and then once you're on the surface things maybe get a, a bit less uh, you know it takes more than six minutes but uh, they will not get necessarily easier uh, so the ESA uh, rover doesn't carry a, a radio thermal uh, generator so okay by the way neither did the early uh, spirit and opportunity from 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 NASA but so we, we are very limited so we are solar powered rover and uh, the rover will be quite limited in terms of of, uh, of energy uh, and and mass as well and, and so the rover doesn't doesn't carry any capability to perform direct uh, to earth or direct from earth communications and that means that all communications to the surface of mars will have to go via relay satellites uh, so we've got the tgo uh, uh, at, at mars that, that we will fulfill the this uh, role but uh, this is a very nice thing also uh, as an outcome of cooperation there's something is uh, that exists and is called the mars relay network uh, there are other orbiters uh, around mars which have uh, all carry compatible radios and they they can provide relay support across agencies across uh, from different lenders um, including max as a, the mars express as an older radio but but it also uh, works and so this adds uh, another layer of complexity one needs to to plan for the for the overflight so having to predict uh, where all the orbiters will be uh, over the different landing sites you'll have to decide uh, which uh, which uh, overflights are going to be used to to trend to to move data from the surface of mars you'll have to look at the which ground stations uh, will you have available to to communicate with the orbiters and then uh, you need to see if the orbiter is uh, maybe behind mars or or not so whether the ground stations are free but what are the deadlines associated to preparing the commands to to send them to mars so this is a huge logistics puzzle and uh, and uh, and uh, complexity which is um, which is part of, of the of the difficulties of the surface operations so this all has to be predicted and and planned in advance and by the way the ground stations are also the planning cycles are one week one sorry one one uh, the long-term planning is one year in advance uh, for the next year so so it's uh, uh, we do it in in chunks of uh, six months but the the, the longest horizon is, is up to a year in, in advance so, so that also makes things you need a lot of coordination there uh, and so we, we haven't this is so in all operations are not real time uh, they are like uh, we 
we sometimes compare it a bit with the old days of playing chess by mail then you you have to do a lot of things and you send and then you don't hear from from your counterparts uh, for a long time um so we, we haven't really done i think anything as complex as that in, in in europe and so to illustrate a bit also the complexity on on the ground uh and of, of this system i i have uh, here a um uh, uh a slide showing the the different elements of the of the of the ground involved in this so so we have let's say the 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 our rover and surface platform mission operation center uh, and uh, if you're on the surface and we want to control the surface platform we will have to there is a system which takes care of the interface between the different orbiters and uh, the different orbiters of course you have the, the mars express you have the tgo we've got the the american orbiters which is actually more than one we've got uh, several ground station networks we use the ESA s track of course but there is uh, also a dsn uh, that, that we use and there's uh, also in the part of the cooperation there's a we were upgrading a, a, an antenna in, in Russia to to also be able to 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 use that plus the the lander control centers uh, on both sides of NASA and uh, and, uh, and 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 Europe and Russia. So we, you can see there's a there's a, a lot of uh, interfaces and interconnections and uh, uh, common operations on on all the ground centers. Uh, some of the tests or the entities involved in counting. Um, quite a few so and uh, so one one of the so one of the challenges then during this preparation phase is, is to test all this and to and to be sure that um, all the all these complex interactions are, are well under control so talking about preparations uh, where, where are we um, so th this is uh, our uh, ground schematic ground segment schedule um, that that we have we here you know spring of uh, 2021 uh, we we have our series of uh, of system validation tests uh, uh, planned uh, then a few a few are are, are are to come launch is September um, we have the 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 big ground segment readiness review uh, quarter one next next year and uh, we'll have. Um, simulations campaigns for both the, the the launch for the arrival for the rover egress so there's an ugly acronym i'll explain it later plte and uh, on the on the spacecraft sides they, they're doing functional validation and uh, completion of the environmental testing at turin uh, and in can the spacecraft just returned from can to, to turin where it continues to be tested the start of the launch campaign uh, will be april uh, next year where the spacecraft goes to goes to baikonur um, to complete the final preparations. Launch window starts on the 20th of September. Uh, actually, it occurs late in the day. So uh, launch is 20th of September, separation is 21st of September. So just watch out for possible confusion uh, later on. And the landing on Mars is uh, for any launch date. We have six possible launch dates. Uh, they'll be on 10th of June um, of 2023. So ground segment now the main focus is completion of the validation, executing SVTs, testing all the interfaces, a series of system operations validations involving all the elements, and of course the the, the Sims campaigns for training of the of personnel. We have several campaigns first before launch, and then for the arrival and the and the surface during during the cruise. So. Um, I, I'll focus a bit now. I'll try not to bore you too much, but on the as a ground segment, um, the, we use um, for the interplanetary missions. We try to 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 reuse our elements of the of the ground segment, and so we are approaching almost a, a, a standard um, ground segment for for these kind of missions. But of course, ExoMars is a little bit uh special uh, mainly because of the different interactions in the surface operation so there are a few elements here that i illustrate in red which are which are novel um to the to the to the mission so of course the, the simulator will have to do something to represent surface operations they normally don't do that the the mission control system will have to it was adapted to to understand 
how to command this, the, the spacecraft basically based on files uh, uh, at the output, input and output of the of the telemetry and TC chains. We have a, a Russian ground station, which, as I mentioned, was upgraded or is being upgraded. So all of this has to be tested. We've got something which is called the ERCO, which stands for European Relay Coordination Office. Um, which basically centralizes all the all the functions having to do with managing the, the the relay network, and of course we've got the interfaces to the to the lander control center, so the the rover control center, the ROC, and the spacecraft, and the, sorry, the the, the surface platform control center, uh, the SPOC, which will be in Moscow, and of course the interfaces of this relay coordination entity with the different orbiters, and also with the American uh, elements uh, running relay. Uh, they have a system called Maros, which is sort of the counterpart to our European one. And in addition, uh, we'll have uh, radio telescopes observing the the arrival, trying to detect uh, the UHF signal. So even if we cannot recover telemetry, as I mentioned, there will be a lot of the things that we'll be able to say from the from the Doppler the analysis of the UHF signal. So all of this has to be. Um, tested and accepted individually and this is all uh, and we have to go through a, a complete ground segment validation test program uh, and so we, we how do we do it we we address it kind of element by element and uh, okay well, all the all this um, is covered by existing standards and uh, okay in the ESO case we have a quality management system which tells us about several processes, including how to build and validate a ground segment. How do we go about doing it? Um, so we, we need to be sure that the, the whole system is, uh, is, uh, is validated and intended for the, for the operations. Uh, and I just wanted to illustrate a bit what's the approach uh, to, that we normally take for such a complex system. So, so here I just have represented, um, so the, the rows are the different phases of the mission and the different blocks are the elements that are, that are involved uh, in, the, in, in, this, in each phase. So I'm going to focus on this middle one, which is the, the egress phase, but PLTE stands for post landing to, to egress. Uh, it's an acronym that somehow stuck in the in the project, um, so I, I don't like it very much to be honest. But okay, so PLTE we've got the the control centers, we've got the ERCO relay coordination, we've got the control center uh, of the of the the lander, which has to interface with the with the TGO control center, which then sends commands through the ground station to the TGO to to Mars, or we can also use the the NASA uh, system and. We interface instead with this Maros system they have, which then through their ground station network and to their uh, relay orbiters. So this is all the elements. So so first of all, we we they, we test all the elements individually. Of course, some of them are already operating, so we don't uh, retest them, but we focus on the interfaces. So we try to first of all, let's say, between all the inter the elements, we we do interface testing. Uh, some of them are. Um, as oak responsibility, uh, so the, the elements on the ground. Some of them we don't retest again because they are operational. So TGO is operational, as are the ground stations and, and as, are, as is the, the American system. And on the right side of the of the um, of the of the slide, so here it's uh, normally under industrial responsibility. The interfaces between the spacecraft themselves, uh, but we kind of mapping this out. We make sure that all the interfaces are covered. Then um, I, sh I spoke about the the system the, the system validation tests, which will will be kind of you know point to point uh, with between our control center and the system that we are controlling, and then we will have uh, a, a series of system operations validation tests, which we in which we involve the entire chain. Uh, but some of the elements might be simulated, but uh, the key point there is that we're interested in the in the end-to-end -end processes uh, that are involved, or in the end-to-end -end performances uh, that are that, that that are involved. So this will, would involve the elements of the ground segment or uh, with the space segment, and depending on what is it that we are interested in, they could be run. Uh, Sometimes we'll replace the spacecraft by a simulator, or if you are interested in 
something that has to do with the spacecraft, I can tell you, for example, the case of Gaia with the time correlation. We will use the, the real hardware, of course. Um, and then, in addition, um, we, we have something which is end-to-end uh, -end tests, which is, uh, um, I would say, not completely standardized, um, but uh, they would run through the complete elements of the of the chain so with the with the real elements and the idea is to really go through the entire chain of the real systems with the real data to to be sure that it everything is uh, is compatible the only other thing i wanted so this is a, the sort of the idea i'll just flick through quickly so we'll we do sort of layer testing for the interfaces and all system and etc and the idea is to be able to to show that we cover the, all the aspects of the of the of the end-to-end uh, -end systems and uh, in a sort of layered fashion to be sure that we capture all the all the things and then here I just I don't spend time here just to to give you a bit of an idea how we would connect to the actual equipment in, in the AIT sites uh, so we've got our mission control systems connected to to something which is provided by ESOC which is an NDIU so network interface uh, Net network data interface unit, uh, which is placed on the IT side, is connected to the to the SCOEs of the of the AIT, and this is the the way by which we connect uh, ESOC to the to the to the actual spacecraft on the ground to do testing before launch. So okay, eventually we'll launch on the on the Russian Proton. Um, ESOC will be will be at this stage will be observing uh, the 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 activities. We're not controlling the, the launch, as you know. And then after after separation, we will acquire the spacecraft using our um, uh, ground station network and uh, in the LEOP itself. So the first activities uh, uh, after after launch will have uh, the LEOP means launch and early orbit operations phase. Uh, the spacecraft will run through its uh, uh, automatic uh, sequence, uh, which includes switching on IMUs, transmitters, a lot of the equipment, uh, the deploying solar arrays, um, to transition to the to, to the different to the spinning up and and uh, pointing to the to the to the sun. Uh, and uh, so at this time, we'll be acquiring telemetry. Uh, we'll do the, the first commanding to check that we can reach the spacecraft and uh, the, the, the computer is, is uh, working properly. Then we'll do some manual activities, including uh, switching on the, 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 the star tracker to allowing us to acquire an inertial pointing. We will do uh, uh, the test maneuver to be sure that um, we, we validate finally then the, 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 the correct uh, commands from, from uh, flight dynamics uh, and uh, and be sure to to calibrate all our measurements and etc. And then we'll do a quick check out of the of the uh, units. So the interplanetary transfer. This is uh, how it looks like. We've got the um, the geometry of the of the of the of the of the transfer. So we we start here at arrival. The Earth will be moved uh, we'll move up, uh, up to there. Mars will be here. Uh, so the the distances involved will be um, the the spacecraft will be at uh, uh, more than double the distance to the to the sun so it will be um, quite far at th th that stage uh, during the transfer we will be doing um, a, a few tra trajectory correction maneuvers so uh, in in this case the transfer is completely ballistic so the moment we we come off the the launcher, we will be uh, falling to to Mars, which is a, an image I like very much from from Michel. Uh, and so um, we'll be just doing some error correction maneuvers, but there will be no deterministic, no deep space maneuvers uh, involved during the cruise. Uh, we will do some checkout of the equipment on the on the on the platform. Uh, we will give the opportunity to the rover control center to do checkouts of, of their um, rover systems before before arrival. And we will be uh, arriving on Mars then in, in June. Um, so the, the the surface mission is, is planned to, to last until the, 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 the start of the global dust storm season uh, in the beginning of 24. 
So the just to give a bit of uh, you know a sense of the of the activities and density of the activities during the the, the cruise. So this was uh, okay. It was a bit of an animation. In the PDF doesn't come out so well, but uh, okay. There's several phases. So the, we are illustrating here the 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 Leop. This is our actual uh, plan for the for the booking and usage of the of the ground stations. Uh, which is called we call a. Uh, uh, usage uh, ground station usage uh, loading profile, where we basically say every week uh, what are the, the the passes that we plan, and this is sort of our input to the ground station planning process. So you see that we have several phases. We have uh, um, the, the, the more or less a week of lead up, very intense passes every day of uh, maximum duration that we can have. Then we have about a month of checkout operations. Then we've got a couple of months of uh, of uh, I wouldn't say quieter, but uh, more, let's say, regular routine um, health checks of the spacecraft interrupted by a, a week or so of of, uh, of checkout of the of the of the lander, uh, and then that until Mars arrival. Mars arrival phase will start uh, about twelve weeks, uh, three months before arrival, where we start intensifying, you know, more frequent uh, contacts. Uh, the, more uh, frequent uh, measurements of the of the spacecraft to to get the the, the correct trajectory uh, reconstructed on the ground to get the the better pinpointing of the of the targeting for the for the arrival and then we culminate with a landing uh, week where we will also have permanent um, coverage from several stations where we will program our our um, commands to 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 prepare the EDL and the first activities on the ground. So um, for, for the arrival phase, this will be a bit like a Leop, but uh, but in reverse. Um, I just wanted to show you a bit the, the what are the actual commands that uh, we will be sending before the ar arrival. So there's a kind of a, a broad five categories of things that they have to do. So one is to configure the GNC to, to the proper attitude and uh, and uh, configuration for the for the idea for the planning itself we will transition the the system to a so-called pre-separation where it will tilt the spacecraft to the right attitude for the separation there will be the the actual commands to to do the separation so they will be sending actual commands to say separate and we will also program the the first relay passes after after the the, the the landing so this will all be programmed from ground before and we will put in some additional commands which are not uh, automatic for things like um, commanding the the cameras uh, to 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 get some images of the during the descent and, and the landing uh, so after the the the, the landing the, the spacecraft is also doing a uh, sort of a um, automatic um, sequence um, which will do the, the the partial deployments of the of the of the rover solar panel uh, to allow the rover to have enough um, power to to communicate by by itself and the objective a bit like the leop is to achieve a system which is stable uh, in terms of power and communications but this time on the on the surface of of of, of mars and this is in principle automatic this will all be checked on the first overflight, which is uh, then the first opportunity we, we have when the when the after the system lands, so we'll be one of the orbiters will fly over the landing site, we'll uh, get the, the data from the from the lander, and then it will be retransmitted back to ESOC. And this is just a, a sort of a, um, illustration of what would be the sort of decision tree that we'll be looking at to decide whether the situation we have is is critical and we need to react uh, immediately or or not so, so it's a bit small maybe to to, to see but we check we, we have telemetry whether we, the hover has, has switched on correctly whether the platform is stable and uh, then we we say yeah okay we are safe or or no and then you will see me panic uh, so uh let me move to the yeah so then after we are safely there uh we will have the the rover egress phase or the, the plte uh, so as i said we've got uh, in, in in red what are 
critical activities related to securing power and communications. Uh, a few of these steps are automatic. Uh, then we will do uh, early uh, a checkout of the hover communication system to ensure we've got two ways of communicating um, uh, after landing. And then once that's all secured, uh, there will be non-critical, non-time critical activities. Um, like you know, the, the rest of the deployments of the rover, the deployment of the locomotion, the solar, the rest of the solar panels, releasing the the hold down release mechanisms for the wheels, releasing the umbilical cable connecting the rover to the platform, then finally, the the, the rover egress. Uh, on the left side, I just have a bit of an illustration how you know the the, the flow of the operations is. So we've got our uh, overflight at Mars. There will be some time delay, typically, between the time the orbiter flies over the landing site until it transmits the telemetry to, to, the, to, to the ground. We'll be looking at the telemetry. We'll be planning or replanning according to a predefined uh, timeline what, what should be the next step, and then sending the things to the ground station and uh, waiting for the orbiter to be visible, sending on to Mars, and then waiting for the orbiter to finally fly again over the landing site. So there will be hours between every uh, opportunity to 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 talk to the to the system yeah good so uh this is just uh i wanted to yeah so we wanted to show you the how the was the actual deployment sequence of the of the of, of the wheels i thought it was interesting to to to, to observe that it's, uh, well, and so and then once the rover is um is uh, so this we will do this. We'll re release the, the 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 hold down release mechanism, which are holding the, the wheels uh, to the to the to the platform. And once we're all happy with the deployments, once we surveyed the, the area around the rover, then we will uh, decide with the with the hawk which way the rover drives, either front or back, to to get outside out of the out of the the platform. And uh, and then from this moment on, then the rover will be controlled. Uh, autonomously, uh, there is always be controlled by the rock, but autonomously by the by the rock. Uh, this is this is how, how it looks like um, the the rock control center. And uh, okay, I've promised Fabrizio to 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 help finding somebody then to come and talk to you about the the rover operations and tell you all about the science and uh, and the and how what it means to drive rovers on on Mars. So I, I leave it there. And uh, for the next time, and uh, just want to just talk, talk a, a little bit about the operation cycle uh, on, on on relay. So the rover will will be uh, operating during the day only, as uh, being a solar powered rover, and uh, the, the the batteries keep it safe during the night, but not they're not big enough for, for much else. And so we'll still operate. Then at the end of the day, ideally there will be an overflight that. Um, then a couple of hours later, typically this is called the the, the latency uh, of the of the relay link. Uh, we'll have the the telemetry available on 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 the ground. The the ground teams will have a few hours, depending on the phasing of all this. Can be you know between five nine hours, typically to to replan the the next day, and they will be sending the commands on which. Take a few hours to get to the to the to the orbiter, depending on ground station availability, orbiter visibility, etc., etc. Plus the the one way uh, uh, light time as well. And so then to prepare the next sol. So this is the, the typical operation cycle, and the the offline nature of it is is illustrated uh, here. And uh, here the the I wanted just to come back a little bit to the to the relay operations. Uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, it's uh, really a, an international effort uh, with between uh, now, now at the moment NASA and and, and ESA, uh, with more uh, nations arriving at, at Mars and doing uh, op operations at, at at Mars. That there's the need for more and more coordination, uh, and so we can see the. The central place that the relay coordination um, takes in enabling uh, this this mission, and this is also this part of the relay coordination and, and the part of you know the interfacing with the um, illustrated here with, with the with the NASA uh, side 
and making sure all the data flows correctly from the different um, parts of the relay network. This is also something that is done at ESOC. So uh, this is uh, uh, ESOC. Um, I don't know if uh, if you're completely familiar. ESOC is the is the operation center of uh, of ESA. Uh, we are um, basically uh, operating most of the ESA uh, science missions and the inter interplanetary missions. Uh, so that's sort of you know, the operations part. Uh, ESOC also operates the the network of uh, of ground stations around around the, the world. So they're centrally commanded from from here. Um, we develop and and, and run uh, the the ground systems and infrastructure that uh, allow uh, enable the the space operations and uh, the ground stations and and all that's related to 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 the infrastructure for mission operations. And now we also have the, the Space Situational Awareness Program at ESOC. We're looking at uh, space weather, space debris, and and monitoring the, the asteroids uh, that might impact uh, Earth. Um, so the, the ESOC, um, being, bringing it a bit, a bit closer, to, to, to home, this is the, the main control room from where we run the, the critical operations at, at ESOC, uh, like the the launches and uh, the rifles at planets. Uh, and uh, this is no, or normally organized uh, like it's illustrated here. So there's um, the, the the front row of the flight control team, as, as, as we call it, as a one position that typically dedicated uh, per subsystem. Uh, depends a bit on the mission, how, but the typical positions are like somebody taking care of the of the system, so timeline, the overall uh, execution of, of procedures. Then uh, engineers dedicated for each of the main parts of the spacecraft. So I have here examples of data handling, IOCS, power thermal, uh, TTNC. Um, this will be what we we have as the our control team. Then the, here at the the, the 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 center, depending a bit, can also be here in the front row. But it's the spacecraft operations manager, uh, who is the, the leader of the of the flight control team. And then here in this room, we also have um, the then support functions. We've got the ground operations manager, who is responsible for the infrastructure and for the for the ground stations. Uh, who is uh, during the critical phases, there will be a person in the room responsible for this. There will be also people dedicated to software support, um, helping us monitoring all the all the different servers, control systems, etc., that are involved in the in the in, in this phase, uh, we'll have uh, a representative of the of the of the project from from Estec typically, or our customer, let's say the owners or the developers of the of the spacecraft will be sitting here, and then the flight operations director, uh, who is the the ultimate operational authority in the in the room, basically will be responsible by the for the proper conduction of the operations according to the rules and authorizing departure from the rules in, in case we are in contingencies unforeseen by the flight operations plan. Um, and so, yeah, the, the reason we, we converge into this room is to ensure that uh, the, the, the communications between the different teams are all centralized, all the telemetry comes into here so that everything is coherent, consistent, and, uh, and to ensure that, that uh, um, the operations are, are done according to a certain plan and in a centralized way. There's also a bit of a ceremonial aspect to, to, to this room. Is, uh, we should also highlight that. Then not in this room, but very close by, we've got the colleagues from uh, from Flight Dynamics. Uh, so, sorry, wrong screen. Okay. Um, it's always a, uh, we'll be responsible for for the orbit prediction, orbit determination, for the calculation of the of the attitudes, uh, uh, the generation of, of commands to to point the spacecraft to execute the maneuvers. They will be sitting in the room next to the MCR, which looks like that. Uh, so they will also be manned uh, during the the critical operations. We have the 
the ground station network, which is also operated by a room close to the MCR, which is the extract control center, which I have an illustration here, another um, room there. And uh, and so coming to, to finish, oops, sorry, too much. So a bit, a bit about myself. Uh, so uh, Fabrizio already said, said the, the, uh, the highlights. I graduated from from uh, the Technical University in Lisbon. Uh, I did an internship at Eurocontrol near Paris at the, uh, the research center. Then I was working at Edisoft uh, for, for a while in the, the, the starting 2001 when Portugal was joining the, the space agency. So it was interesting to, to have a sort of start of the Portuguese uh, space industry then. Uh, then I came to ESOC, joined SciSys, I was a contractor at ESOC, and then joined these in 2006, 2009, sorry. Um, and uh, yeah, this is me in the, I think this was on the Gaia uh, launch campaign, or, uh, just a couple of weeks before Gaia. Um, and that is, uh, I was on the Met on the first MetOp launch team, I worked a little bit on Lisa Pathfinder, Rachel and Planck, Gaia. And now on, on ExoMars, since 2015, um, I have the, the privilege and the honor of taking over as Grand Summit Manager from, from Michel Denis, who has been talking to you also recently. And uh, okay, Fabricio said I'll be the, the flight director. Uh, it is tradition that the, the, the Grand Summit Manager ends up being the, the flight director, but he has to be nominated by the uh, uh, head of operations. And uh, okay, I guess. Uh, I have to behave until then. Uh, so, um, the what I would like then to to also highlight is the the amount of people uh, that are involved in at ESOC, Certainly, this is a traditional uh, family photo of a of a, of a launch. We we all have that. This is Beppy, and. Uh, Essentially, I'd like to, to, to highlight that there's a lot of people, a lot of different roles. And, and I mean, the, in the talk, you, you could see the, the, the different aspects of, of uh, from the, from the uh, technical aspects of controlling the spacecraft, the details of the subsystems, the operations, the, the, the testing, the, the keeping all this uh, tidy, uh, our project controllers, our uh, people working with the computers and etc. So it's a, a very wide range of uh, of, uh, of uh, the abilities and needs that, that we have to work in space so uh, it's uh, there's a place for for practically all kinds of uh, backgrounds and uh, and also i think one thing i, I like to to also say is the um, that the range of abilities to to work in the business you, you need to be able to sort of Abstract at the level of the solar system, you know, because we we're traveling from maybe one one point to the to the other, very big scales, but also the the detail uh, which is involved in the um, in the operation of very complex uh, machines. But sometimes you need to go down to the to the bit uh, or to the the signal level in in some acquisition and uh, to the noise there and understand why you have a zero instead of a one, for example. And this is all things that that we have in our day to day. So this is, uh, so that and the combination of people is, is I think one of the most interesting uh, things of all. So I get to the end, I maybe have exceeded the time a little bit. I had a couple of hiccups. Uh, I, I would normally maybe uh, close with a different picture. I, I chose this one. In fact, this has nothing to do with, with COVID actually. It was, uh, my intention was to show the people. And uh, just a final uh, message on, on the, all this complexity and all these fantastic things that, that we do uh, with, the, with the help of a lot of people is that in the end, it's really a lot about the people and uh, being a, a fairly you know technical job, uh, we can't do it uh, without uh, communicating, without understanding uh, each other, without a bit of psychology. Um, and so, yeah, that's it. Uh, thanks a lot for, for, the, for the attention. Um, it's very weird to talk to a computer instead of an audience full of people. So uh, I'm a bit stressed about it, but okay. You've been a very nice audience so far. So thank you. Okay.
Thanks to you, Tiago. It's been very, very, very interesting. I hope it's the same for everybody. And uh, yes, we are a little bit late, but we can recover. If you don't mind, I will leave it here so you can answer your question. You, you can see your face. I know it's weird. I know that. There is very little. <laughs> it's, it's horrible, but OK. OK, I, I can put myself in the picture if you want. And uh, so maybe it's a little oh, Thank you, Fabrizio. It's nice to have company. <laughs> <laughs> So let's go with the question. We have about 11 questions right now, so we have to. Um, we have less than, let's say, half an hour to answer all of them. Okay. So uh, consider that. So our first question: and uh, how difficult is the incorporation of the different technologies, uh, Russian uh, versus European versus NASA, when designing such a complex system? What type of lessons have been learned to make future collaboration more effective? And thinking in particular about. Uh, previous failure caused by the use of different standards uh, and metrics, for example, metric and good work or something like that. And there is only one American failure about that, but it's very yeah. tricky to blame it only on yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. So I think in, in this case, okay, we the, the, um, the, the failures we got were not related to, 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 to that particular aspect, but it is um, very difficult to incorporate uh, the, the the, the different elements. Uh, one thing that was at the core of the cooperation, and in fact is a little bit, I would say, the price to pay, is that um, in, in a cooperation you need to, each party uh, uses more or less their standards to do stuff, right? And then what you need to be extremely careful is at the interface. Now, if you can afford to have a very clean interface, then things might be a bit easier. In this case, they are not, okay? And uh, and I think it's a, uh, it's, uh, uh, the lessons are still being learned. I wouldn't like to volunteer any any particular one uh, because even in cases where we believed that we were kind of enforcing standards and say, look, guys, we, we should use this, even that is is not obvious. I mean, consider the case with the, with the, with the Russians. The level of English, for example, is uh, is uh, is not uh, very consistent across the board, which is fair enough. My level of Russian is also zero. So we have to understand always both parts of the of the story. Uh, I think it, one lesson is you, you really need to to take the time and sit with the colleagues and make sure that uh, that we understand the at the technical level the issues that are that are being discussed. Um, and then here comes a bit of uh, cultural uh, awareness as well. So sometimes things are not what they appear, and you think you understand and you haven't. Yes, <clears throat> my personal experience is that uh, sometimes language is always a barrier, and uh, and the risky thing is that sometimes people say yes when they didn't really understood the question, and uh, sometimes this may happen. So you have to pay attention. The engineering system helps to verify these things anyway. Now the question is: uh, Was the Skytrain method of landing the rover considered for this mission? Would this have had mass implication for the rover? I'm sorry, I didn't. I didn't understand the start of the question. Fabrizio. Yeah, if, if the if you ever thought of using the industry thought of using the sky crane mesh method that you want to use by GPR. Well, uh, maybe, but uh, we we don't have that technology, so um, we we're using more traditionally, if you like, uh, um, methods. I have to say, I don't know if at any point. Of the history of ExoMars, uh, Skycrane was was being considered. I wouldn't. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's something that I I could look up next time I ask this. I don't have to <laughs> say I don't know. Uh, a lot of people are going to ask you that in the future, so be ready for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, thanks. Thanks for the question, actually. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah you, you can. You should remember them, man. <laughs> so yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So I, have, I have a question for myself. I put it in the list. Can you say something more about what you called the, the what was in the diagram called the ESA OBC in the rover? Why is an ESA OBC on board computer? Ah, um, actually, yeah, I, I, I can say why. Uh, originally, uh, in the um, initial uh, plans for the design of the of the descent module of of the spacecraft, actually, the intention was to have one computer from Europe driving the let's say the the cruise and the, and the landing and one computer from Roscosmos or the the russians to do the the surface phase and they were designated uh, ESA obc okay i don't actually know how was the the name of the of the russian computer then the 
it evolved. The Russian computer was kind of morphed into a payload control computer. In the diagram, it's the it's the BIP, uh, which is an interface to the to the payloads. But the name is OBC stuck, and uh, yeah, it's one of these things that. Uh, but that's the from the original separation of of the having a computer to do part of the of the mission and another computer to do a different one. But by the way, the, the Americans have a single computer in, in their rover that runs the entire mission. It's just that when they land, they change the software into something else. Yes, indeed. That was a question. In fact, that they said. So basically, yeah. we, have a, we have three main computers, one for the cruise module, one for the landing platform, and one for the rover itself. Mm, actually, no. The, 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 the carrier module does not have a computer. Okay, so it's all run by the by the computer on the on the platform, which is a European computer indeed, and uh, this is one of the complications and okay, one of the design choices that that could be, I guess, uh, challenge the, the there are advantages and disadvantages certainly, is that the the software that will run the cruise is the same that will run the landing is the same that will run the surface mission and. The rover software is in the rover and it remains uh, inactive during most of the cruise, apart from the checkouts, and it'll only be activated after long, after landing. Okay, so the carrier module is uh, completely lost after the separation, basically. Yep. Because you said right. you were trying to con contact it uh, after the separation. I know, sorry, but I meant contact, I meant, uh, yeah, yeah, okay, mm, that might have been misleading. He meant the, the, the platform, the, sorry, the, the carrier modules separates from the from the rest of the of the spacecraft at end bumping against each, each other during the entry. So just to make sure that they are separate enough when they go in that they don't make contact, mm -hmm. but not in the sense of communication. Sorry, okay. if I uh, was misleading. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you. Uh, there is another question by myself. <laughs> sorry, I was. So curious about many things, but and then there is another one. But you mentioned that there are files to command the spacecraft. Uh, were, you re were you referring to the carrier module or the rover or both? And what are the implications for the flight software? What does it mean commanding by files instead of usual ones? Okay. Okay. That's a uh, hmm. good question. Uh, I'll try to give you a, a brief um, answer. So files are a necessity uh, because we mm, command via relay, okay? So you have to imagine the, the relay orbiter uh, will have a system on board uh, with, the, with the radio uh, and, and uh, uh, the, the um, 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 I'm sorry, a mass memory, a PDA Jew, but okay, it's essentially you can think of it as a hard disk, a mass memory, no? And the, the relay system will pick files from this memory to send to um, to the rover or to the landing platform yeah so basically we'll take the file and then start taking the commands that are inside and then putting them in the in the proximity one protocol and sending these things to the to the surface and so the natural way to to put these things on board the orbiter is to transfer a file to the orbiter and when on the way back on the return link as we call it telemetry is going to be packaged in a file in the orbiter and is going to be delivered to the control centers as files, okay? So these files are at the level of, if you like, just packaging sets of telemetry and commanding data, uh, but there isn't any direct link uh, to files on board the spacecraft, okay? There will be that, okay? But the, the two things are, are a bit separate. Um, we will command uh, sets of activities um, in files that will be sent uh, uh, inside this relay product. And these files, yes, they will be visible inside the onboard software of the different, uh, uh, of the hover and, and of the platform. And the usage of that, okay, primarily uh, can be used to ensure integrity of the commands because the file transfer will ensure that you either have all file or, or you don't execute anything and can also be used to, to have uh, sets of, of, uh, of commands which could be called and repeated on, on board uh, and avoiding having to, to, to send them all the time. So in terms of implications, there are uh, push services um, dedicated to files. The, 
the current version or the previous version of the PUS, the PUS A, didn't really standardize this. So there was a service 13 uh, to, to handle files, but this was not actually standard. There was a few flavors that have been used in the, in the past. And with the new PUS C, this is trying to be standardized in terms of managing files on, on, on boards. And mind you, then it doesn't tell you anything about how to transfer files. You can use things like CFDP and things like that, which is we're not using uh, on the on the Mars applications at the moment. But between the orbiters and the ground center, yes, but uh, on board the rover, not not really. Okay, thank you. But the question is, what is what's inside the file then? It's just uh, telecoms. Well, like telecoms. Yeah. Telecoms. Or they are the equivalent of onboard control procedures. Mm, well, typically, okay, you can actually have both. In fact, so you can transfer, depending a bit on how the onboard software is designed, you, you can have uh, OBCPs uh, as, a, as a file, as a binary compiled file, which is um, put on board and there's an interpreter that just reads binary code from, from there. Or you can have a file containing a sequence of commands, so a predefined sequence of commands. So I don't know, change a mode or activate a set of telemetry packets or um, this is you could put on board and be reusable or the typical application in, in planetary missions is you load the, the timeline, you put a set of commands in a file, you transfer everything on board and then you are sure that uh, if the file arrives uh, in its own, you can check it, you can then uh, execute it only once once it's uh, once it's on board. So but you can have several things you can and then on the return, you, you will have uh, telemetry frames inside the file. Okay. okay. Okay, so uh, how can you test the parachute when atmosphere and gravi gravity are different? This well, from, this is a question yeah. from Julia. Yeah, so you you take uh, you take uh, um, so I will be very careful with my answer because it's not my responsibility and it's not my actually the area of competence. Okay, but uh, it's. Um, you, you basically take uh, uh, balloons and take it up to the atmosphere where the density uh, is um, is uh, is uh, e equivalent so to achieve the Mach numbers that are that are required and then you scale the the, the, the whole system so that the dynamics and dynamic forces are are equivalent but you can test it on earth so you you do that for the parts of the you know parachute inflation and etc and then you do with test rigs as I show on on, on the ground where you have the the parachute package inside its uh, bag and you do a sort of high speed uh, extraction to be sure that all the you know the the, the, the bags uh, don't interfere with the with the parachute as it comes out they don't have damage uh, with the folding with the different cables and then etc but uh, yeah the, there are ways to do to do it okay thank you Another question for myself. I was wondering, uh, many of your slides show the different aspects of the complexity and you use different diagrams for that. So what are the skills, in your opinion, that are required to a newly graduated engineer or whatever else, maybe whatever, whatever degree, to manage this yeah. complexity? What do you think? Does the university prepare prepares you enough or you need uh, other things? Mm. Well, okay. Um, the, the, I think the answer is is really it depends. Uh, it depends. The the one very interesting thing I think in the in in, in operations is that you have a huge variety of uh, tasks that you can do. Yeah. So typically we have uh, relatively junior engineers joining uh, with with uh, with a vast different uh, uh, sets of uh, backgrounds yeah? we have uh, we have physicists we have uh, we have aerospace engineers we have computer engineers so it's a uh, in the end you need to to have uh, um, the ability to to abstract you know for example taking the uh, the tests between uh, yeah, our control system and the and the and the spacecraft. We will have a, um, for instance, we're testing some procedure to switch on some unit. Uh, the, the 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 person joining, say if it's a, a young uh, engineer that doing operations, will be will be sitting in a team. There will be people with a bit more experience and a, a bit uh, uh, you know they will tell him, look, here is the user manual of the of the spacecraft. There is a something from industry saying this is how you do it 
and uh, now we have to translate it into uh, real commands and uh, and real instructions for the for the operator so the, you need to to be able to understand documentation you need to be able to to look at the complex system and uh, abstract what's important and what's not you you have to categorize um things which are complex and maybe sometimes a, a bit um, I wouldn't say unstructured, but uh, but uh, you you need to put some structure into into the thinking, into the into the analysis of the of the problem. So um, I it you have to have uh, some soft skills as, as we call today. So the ability to 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 communicate uh, well and and clearly, the the ability to sort of you know. Um, uh, inquire when something is not uh, is not uh, clear, say from the expectations of uh, of uh, of what is being asked, um, and what else? The um, there are there are so many backgrounds and so many the the, the, the tasks are so diverse that I would say that any anybody uh, with a, with a sort of the background and the interests uh, uh, in. In, in, in there could could work in space, but okay. But what we look at uh, specifically is you know no, knowledge on the on the subsystems of the of the of the spacecraft. So you know if you know um, how a spacecraft works, the, the the main subsystems of the spacecraft, to the, the you know the, the power and thermal, the AOCs, the TTNC, what are the main elements that compose our ground segment and, op and operations um, that the the, the different interfaces to the to the spacecraft, uh, having a notion of the standards uh, that are involved. Uh, so the CSS has a lot of standards for a lot of the the areas, uh, including operations. Uh, that's that that's useful. Um, understanding the the development of the ground segment a bit. What I try to to explain here: the different phases uh, be, before the the launch, the different testing, the how you set up testing between the different elements of the ground segment. Uh, principles of systems engineering, like you know, you've got the requirements, you've got the design, you've got the interfaces. How you go about testing all this and, and uh, validating, verifying both you know down and up along the, the V uh, uh, of the of the engineering of the system engineering process. Uh, all this, um, the different development phases of a space mission. Uh, so these are all relevant uh, things that we normally look for for let's say junior uh, engineers uh, joining. Okay, okay, thank you. A question from Francis: uh, With uh, lander communication dependent on increasingly aged orbiters, do you see a need for more orbiters, mostly dedicated to communication relay? Perhaps several small spacecraft could be launched on a single mission. Just a question, uh, an answer for myself uh, to, to Francis. Please note that the NASA project to have Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter working until 2028. So, I hope it keeps working because I, <laughs> my work depends on that a little bit. <laughs> yeah. So, so the 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 orbiters at, at Mars, they have proven quite durable. Yeah. So, so Mars Express is there since. Uh, since a long time, the TGO has uh, fuel and resources for for a long time. We always come up with ways to to squeeze out the you know lifetime out of the out of the missions. And so far, the the, the main orbiters at Mars are 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 in I would say in, in good shape, yeah, and in excellent shape considering the age of uh, of some of them. So so they are there and they will support the this mission. Um, the next big Mars missions that are now in the plan is the the Mars Sample Return. Uh, and they will have a dedicated orbiter um, that will do, you know, relay uh, support uh, during the surface mission. Okay, it's the orbiter that will bring the samples back to Earth, but it will be dedicated to to to, to relay support. And there are, of course, discussions when you think about the future of, of Mars missions and how to set up what is needed. Communication is um, central to to that. So. We haven't arrived at a at a sort of a final configuration of, of how it should look like, but uh, but uh, yeah, there, there are kind of you know developing the the concepts for the for the future. 
and uh, central communication, so you have either a tr trunk or, or making sure that we have permanent comms at, at Mars is certainly at the at the at the core of it. I mean, there are several proposals, several things, including you know, commi dedicated communication satellites, uh, small satellites, uh, relay uh, satellites. So there's a lot uh, of, of of attention in that area. Yes. Okay. So we have uh, Nina from London that says, uh, good evening and thank you for the talk. Yeah. And when do you think that first human-led mission will land on Mars? And if this is going to be a one-way ticket for them? I think this, this is not going to, this is a personal opinion. Yeah, I total disclaimer, not uh, his uh, opinion here at all, just uh, my own. Uh, okay, whether it's a one-way ticket, then I, I sure would hope not, but uh, there are probably people crazy enough to say yes. So well, I would never exclude that, but I, I don't think so. I think if I look at the timeline of the missions that I know, I, if I had to guess, uh, I, I would say in, not before the mid thirties, I would think towards the end of the decade, but that's just my kind of personal feeling. I, I didn't apply to the astronaut selection, actually, so I, I don't plan to go to Mars. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Yeah. And uh, we have Steve, Steve Salmon, that is asking, why was a Russian vehicle chosen for the launch, as opposed to the ESA, Vega, the mm -hmm. Edition, or the NASA SpaceX launchers? Was the choice mm -hmm. for economic reasons? Okay, I wouldn't say economic reasons. I would say that uh, it's part of the Russian contribution to the, to the cooperation. So they 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 brought they brought two launchers um, to launch two missions. It's a heavy launcher, very expensive, and uh, it was the way to to enable the the mission. So it was one of these things that it's um, as 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 usual. Um, we can do more things together than what if we could do alone, and that's at the heart of the cooperation. And this with this arrangement with the Russians, that that what what came out. I have a question from Alistair. It sounds as if uh, success through failure is the, the is uh, sorry lost it is uh, something you believe in as you learn so much more from a failure than a success. <laughs> what are the most important lessons have you learned from previous failure? Well, I I think the way I think of it, okay, not necessarily in terms of uh, uh, success or, or failure, but more. Uh, you have to try things in order to be successful, yeah. And uh, as part of those attempts, the initial ones you you will call them tests, okay. And uh, the whole purpose of a test is is to fail because otherwise you haven't learned anything, right? So so y by definition, a good test is a test that finds problems. Then of course you have to fix them, and eventually you want to have a test that doesn't find any problem, but you need to be convinced that that your test is uh, is good enough, right? And so, in the beginning, uh, uh, something that doesn't work uh, is a success because you found problems and you fix it, you know. And then later on, when you're convinced that uh, that it works and it doesn't, or it's supposed where it doesn't, then it's a failure. But then, hopefully, you will still learn from it. And uh, and and so, I think this is the bit the cycle, and uh, it has to do with with the timing where you consider uh, and how mature you are with your with your with your approach, and uh, and I think it's uh, yeah it's 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 a mindset uh, yeah I, I so I do believe that uh, okay even when you fail you should you have to look for the for the for the reasons behind and uh, not you know, in a matter of pointing fingers but just to understand what is the chain of events that that happen it's normally a chain of events uh, the combination of things that if any single one of them had not occurred. You would not have the problem, so um, so yeah. L looking for that is also part of the of the. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, Setting yeah. up uh, the negative scenarios is very difficult because you have to be very imagine a lot of things, and uh, it's not easy. Okay, with engineers and technicians, this is this is question from Les Shoulder. With engineers and technicians from uh, all the different countries, by necessity using English as a second or third or fourth language, 
Is the heavy use of acronyms a potential area of confusion? How do you ensure that the information is correctly being applied? It's difficult. Yeah, a good question. Um, the acronyms actually tend to, well, I was about to say something is uh, maybe not fully correct. We, we try that the acronyms are um, one and the same, and so we, we don't change them along the way in case we, we, we change languages. However, and this is why I was hesitating, on the first spacecraft I worked on, uh, a lot of the telemetry in the database and the commands in the database were, were in French, including the acronyms were different. And it was actually very funny because the, on the main side of the equipment were in English and on the redundant side they were in French. So, and then the acronyms did change and, and it was, uh, it was okay, it wasn't a problem in, in the end, but, uh, but uh, it was, uh, yeah, you could see the, the difference. And so one thing we try to do and uh, okay, I, I try to do is at least when, when you report things to people who are not intimately familiar with the, with the subject, try to avoid acronyms uh, if, if I can. But as you see, it's very difficult. And sometimes we find ourselves with almost full sentences and 90% uh, of the words are, are acronyms. What helps is to, is okay, we, we try to use standard terms, yeah? And uh, uh, we have insisted that uh, we have a central list of, uh, of acronyms that we refer to in practically every document that is centrally available, people can go and check. Um, but it goes a bit back to what we were saying before. Eh? We, if we are talking um, with, with colleagues, you have to be sure that the questions are, are understood. You know, that, that uh, the, really the, you know, this classic problem of communication is this, what you think, what you say, what the other person perceives, you know, what you really said, and they're all different things. And, and we have to be very aware of that. Yes. Yes, yes. Documentation is important for that, and uh, the quality of documentation is also important. Sometimes it's disregarded. Um, yeah. Question from Alex. Uh, what are the main improvements you would like to see on the next mission? Uh, <laughs> direct from Earth communications. Yeah. Okay, yes, I can imagine that. Some direct con yeah. Yes, yes, yes. I saw in fact that in the end-to-end -end test, you also plan to use TGO. So basically, you are really simulating that the rover is, uh, for example, is, or the landing platform is on Mars and you are involving TGO during that test. What we do, actually, uh, we don't we don't use the, the, the real TGO. We use the, it's called the, the engineering model of the TGO, oh, okay. or the, okay. the avionics test bench, yeah, which is a very faithful, uh, reproduction of the TGO with all the hardware elements, real, you know, copies, physical copies of the of the elements flying, and we will flow our commands and telemetry through that. And we will connect uh, also via RF links in the in the lab between the TGO and the representation of the rover and of the, uh, of the surface platform. Okay. Um, yeah, and then, uh, of course, we have some test data from actual rover flights at Mars between the TGO and and uh, and the American rover. So so we can you know it's not the same, but there will be things which we'll be look at then compare the two and, and be sure that the behavior we see is the, is the same. And it, just curiosity, but very quickly, do you, do you simulate also the Doppler effect between the the orbiter and the rover when you use the RF link to them in touch? On the UHF, uh, I'm. I'm not sure. Uh, this I don't. I'm not sure. I don't. I don't know. I don't okay. know. Well, if we if we do um, that would be tricky because you have to RF links on the X band. We we do we do test that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Final question from Alex. What are the main lessons from this from this project? So what do you expect to learn, or what did you already learn that working on this project? Uh, okay. Good question. Well, I, I can, well, for, for ESA, I think I would uh, let the project go uh, before any kind of final statements, um, because uh, there is, a, of course, there's a lot of things that you can say about, about cooperation, but there's a lot of, you know, um, th that enables us doing things. So, so it's in, in a way it's, uh, it's the price to pay. So how to manage it, there may be things to be, to be learned. 
Um, I, I think uh, the, for sure this this very integrated systems is 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 a is a difficulty. Yeah, and uh, that even with the cooperation, that could be other ways of of of, of doing it. But okay, this is how it turns out. I, I would not like to to spend you know to elongate much there. Um, but I mean, to me personally, is is a bit you know not. Uh, having this this complexity needs you kind of need a, a plan to manage this complexity and then you need to sort of you know uh try to understand what what are your 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 main hurdles and sometimes they're not in the obvious places and um and the one thing that at least to me personally as well uh, is is the um, trying to to estimate the sort of resources that we need to 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 run this uh, when I personally would tend to be maybe a bit too optimistic with that and we should we should be careful to take uh, enough margins on on time on, on on effort on people which is of of course is, is easy to, to say but very hard to do because we all live in you know it's a limited resources everywhere by definition and there's always a big push to be more efficient so there's always the temptation to say you know uh, do it with less people, do it with uh, with uh, less resources, but uh, it's something that maybe one one can be a bit, uh, let's say, more conservative. Uh, I would think, but but uh, well, um, otherwise, it's, that's it. Okay, okay. Thanks a lot, Thiago. So we have to finish here because also our time is really very, we just have a few minutes left and we have Alistair that is coming back for his final, uh, the close out of this talk. I personally thank you a lot for your availability and uh, it has been a great talk and uh, we hope to see you and maybe later, maybe 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 next uh, fall, next, sorry, next autumn, yeah. you will update us in the progress if you want. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks a, lot. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. It was, it was, yeah. Apologies for the technological hiccup, but uh, okay. No problem. We should have told that before. Yeah. Lesson learned for next time, and we always yeah, learn. Listen, exactly. So next time, it is an item for my check. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Well, th thank you very much. I hope you can all hear me all right. Perfect. Well, yeah. Good. Well, thank you. That really was tremendous. I think um, we, we learned a lot from that, and I think one of the most impressive things was how cool you were when uh, when the slides all disappeared because i think that shows that you have the ability to guide and to lead the team that's going to land on mars i think it will require a certain coolness to actually achieve that one with all the problems that you're likely to meet um yeah. i was uh, i was uh, lucky to be part of the beagle 2 uh, team doing the PR for it, so I, I know how it feels. Um, yeah, I think uh, really we've had 118 people joining us tonight, and from far and wide, including Michelle from the sun kissed beaches of Hawaii to Rich in the fog and ice 400 kilometers north of the Arctic Circle. So we've had quite a variety of people. Thank you also, Fabrizio, for the introductions and for coordinating the QA. Uh, excellently again and thanks also to Elizabeth for coordinating the evening behind the scenes. I have to say privately that, that my motto in life has been success through failure because I've learned an awful lot from my failures than I have from my successes. Um, I hope all of you have enjoyed tonight's talk and want to make, if you want to make a donation please click on the donate button Every little helps to cover our costs. And before you go, our next evening lecture is on Wednesday, the 19th of May, when Ron Miller, the renowned American space artist, will talk about the long distance traveler, his life and his work. And a further reminder is that on the 28th to the 30th of June, the Reinventing Space Conference is going to happen live in the Curie 2 Conference Center in Westminster. The full program will be announced shortly. And finally, the 2020 Sir Arthur Clarke Awards. The finalists have been selected, so I must thank all that participated in the uh, awards. 
over 160 nominations for 75 nominees. And I have to thank also our 60 judges who have now selected the finalists for the 10 awards. These finalists will be announced soon and all of them will be invited to the Reinventing Space Conference dinner in the QE2 Conference Centre on 29th of June, where the 2020 awards will be presented. So we hope to see you all there and we hope we will be able to do this live. Thank you again for a tremendous talk tonight, Tiago. That was great. And I think we've learned a lot from what you said and you answered the question brilliantly. So thank you very much and good night you. to you all. Goodbye all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.